Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat interview, and it's great to have you this morning. I'm talking with Mihaela. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to actually be invited to, to your uh, podcast. Um, yeah, why, why, why don't we start that? Let's do it like a full introduction, like uh, you know who you are, what you do, where you're located, all those details. Okay. Well, uh, I'm a software engineer located in Romania, simply said. Um, I'm interested in uh, everything that has to do with uh, uh, the technical world. I'm still discovering uh, a lot of things since I'm sort of in the beginning of my career. I like to, <laughs> to believe that. Um, and I like to combine public speaking and training with yeah, what I know, what I do in my, uh, in my job and uh, yeah, try to grow uh, by learning from others and also uh, preparing uh, the content for others. Uh, Regarding you're, you're, you're like a brand new MVP. I mean, you'd like just earned it in developer technologies, which is actually a broad category. And I've met, I've talked and interviewed people that are, you know, more on the non-technical side of developer technologies, but they just kind of found their way into a, 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 a niche within the space and, and earned their MVP. So kind of what was your path into becoming an MVP? Well, for me, it was first the passion of uh, uh, knowledge sharing and uh, presentations, and then I found out about uh, uh, MVP. So I started, uh, yeah, because I saw a lot of uh, people speaking at conferences and being passionate about uh, what they were talking about. And uh, uh, I saw that energy. So I was like, okay, maybe I can also give something to the people in front of me. Maybe I know something that someone is interested. Mm -hmm. And so I started like this, had a successful presentation the first time that I actually uh, held a presentation and very good feedback. And I just uh, got that energy and uh, I fell in love with it and started to uh, just uh, presenting and preparing every time I had the occasion. And then at some point, uh, someone that is uh, uh, yeah, located in, uh, in Yash and yeah, we got to know each other from, uh, from the conferences. He was like, okay, you are having so many activities and you are speaking at conferences and uh, uh, preparing uh, all sorts of uh, meetups and things like this. Why don't you just apply for an MVP uh, award? And I was very like, what? I'm, I'm so at the beginning and what I, I, I don't know. I had the, I had doubts regarding to if I, would really be successful. So I tried and uh, yeah, it worked in the end. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, actually he got me into uh, finding the courage to, to do this. Yeah, that's uh, one of the, I, I think the kind of misnomers about the MVP is that, you know, some people think, well, and, and there are plenty of MVPs out there that are my go-to technical resources for certain areas, but being an MVP doesn't necessarily mean that you are the expert on all of those topics in there. It's, you've got expertise, deep expertise within it. That is a requirement, um, but it has as much to do with sharing. There are plenty of people that are very smart, brilliant architects, but they are not like the social aspect of it. They, they don't do the community activities that would automatically kind of push them into the MVP community. So it's, uh, there's a lot to be said about that, that volume. And like, what was your first topic that you presented on? Do you remember? The first time that I talked, it was about clean code. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so best practices, clean code, uh, solid principles, if I remember. Yeah, things like this. Well, that's the kind of stuff too that, uh, so I've <laughs> found that, you know, even when I was, I started, my career as is a technical project manager. And so when I first did user groups and things that I would present on methodology and I would talk about my interactions with my teams, it wasn't me going in there saying, I know all, here's how you do all of these things. I was sharing my experience. My, I worked in uh, the telephony world. I worked for the telephone company Pacific Bell back then, uh, my first user group. Uh, and here's the, what I do, this is how we do it, why we did it. And in fact, I think my first topic was on building a front door process for our organization's portal. 
um, and what we did and why we did it. And I got so much feedback from other people who had had similar experiences that I went back and shared. I changed my presentation. I did another version of that. But I also, it, it impacted my day job. I improved the solution because of the feedback that I received, which I would never would have had if I hadn't had the, you know, the gumption to get up and to talk about it uh, from that perspective. But that's a lot about what being an MVP is as well, just sharing your perspective, your experiences. All of my presentation until this moment, or and all the content actually that I'm creating, it's based on things that, okay, I encountered in my day-to-day -day work or issues that I managed to uh, solve somehow, or things that maybe other developers or other teams, uh, if they would know the experience that I had, maybe uh, I could help them. So this is how I actually create uh, create content. I. Um, I really believe in uh, uh, the fact that a presentation or any sort of uh, content sharing, it's more effective when you actually add that experience, that personal experience, mm. because yeah, talking just the theory is not really working. Well, I mean, it, it's it, not talking it, the, the audience. Well, <laughs> and, and that's the thing too, is that, I mean, they're not knocking people that go and write the detailed walkthrough articles or create videos of how to do things. But so much of the benefit of, uh, especially for uh, an in-person presentation, but I would even argue for those, what, if you're doing that documentation is share those personal stories, that personal experience, the industry specific nuances of the solution that you're building as well. Because you may go build a solution in the healthcare space that might be 95% the same as somebody in financial services but then they have special nuanced, you know, needs. And mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's valid to go do another version of that when you've had that experience with that other industry or for somebody else within an industry to have, to kind of piggyback on the work that you've done, but then share their version of that in their space with their experience. Yeah. And in this way, you also uh, receive some feedback on the solution that you have, because maybe someone had, as you were saying, uh, the same experience, maybe a bit into the details, a bit different, and you're like, okay, they solved it in another uh, in another way, and that way maybe is helping you also to uh, go further with uh, with what you're doing. So it's I'm having this feeling that uh, when uh, someone is presenting, everyone is like, okay, that person knows it all and um, has the best solution, but it's not like that. I really feel that for me, it's a, a uh, growing experience and uh, a lot of knowledge sharing in both ways when uh, when I'm presenting when I'm talking to to people well, you know it's it's my favorite format whether for like a conference or like I just did yesterday uh, or, or sorry today's Friday yeah so on Wednesday time is uh, is meaningless <laughs> now you know uh, but had a panel discussion where we're doing it we did an AMA style ask me anything and we're answering community questions. And what I love about that is, again, having, having five, six people addressing a problem, it may be that only one person knows part or the entire answer to the question, um, or you might have five or six completely different perspectives, but add to, we might have each had an experience with that problem and have part of a solution, um, but we then add to that. And so I learned so much from having participated in that. And, you know, to your point, I mean, nobody is a complete expert on any, uh, well, let me refer, I was going to say there's nobody's an expert on everything on a single topic, but that's not true. There are people out there that, yeah. that know everything about that. But um, generally speaking, even those experts that in depth on a technology don't have your industry experience, don't have your experiential learning. Um, you know, your, your interactions or don't have your voice and your experience. Like, again, I bring to the table my years as a business analyst project manager, and that's a perspective I've brought into my entire career. And so I always go back to that. How would a PM, how would a BA treat this technical problem? And I feel like I help represent that voice in technical solutions. 
Yeah, I, I remember that the first time that I was uh, about to present, like the night before or something like this, I was very emotional because again, my uh, uh, imposter syndrome <laughs> kicked in and it was like, what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to, to talk to a conference. I'm too young and inexperienced. And uh, there is someone that actually uh, uh, said some words to me that uh, I, I just keep on uh, uh, playing them in my mind every time I, I feel this sort of, uh, I have this sort of feeling. And he says something like this, okay. So basically, of course, there might be people that know more than you on that matter. And of course, there might be people that know less on that subject. But you have to think that in the way that your content is built in this moment and with your slides and your speech and everything, you know the best, like that form, it's your, it's your best and you, you know it best. Of course, you are going to learn. Of course, you are going to teach others, but you have to be confident about the presentation that you've created in the state that it is now. And then you can just develop it and, uh, and grow more from that. So that was like the best advice that I, uh, that I received. Yeah, and well, I give it forward, of course. Well, I, that's exactly the point is that you, you're, you are sharing your experiences and, and somebody then provides that feedback. Somebody asks a question, if I don't know the answer to, I have gone back on most of my sessions. I love getting that kind of feedback. One of the worst things is that you get an audience and they're just quiet. They're not asking questions. You're like, did I, I present the right content? Did I address your questions? Uh, and that's one thing that's hard about online versus in person. If you can see that people are disconnecting, disengaged, or if they're just like, like, no, in the side conversation, be like, then you can point to them and be like, is there a scenario that I missed here? And, and it's, I've gone in modified presentations with that. I love that interaction. Yeah, well, even though for me, I have to admit that uh, the pandemic was a very good period for public speaking and the conferences, because uh, I had the chance to travel all right. over the yeah world then uh, present indeed you lose that uh, that connection with uh, with your audience and um when you are presenting and you have the like the audience in front of you you can see if one of them is maybe a bit bored and things like this or you can uh, get the vibe of the of the room and try to adjust to that so you're maybe just doing a joke uh, out of nowhere just to get the energy uh, going uh, again and when you're on an online conference it's like so quiet and you're speaking to your camera and you don't get the feedback so you try to do it as um i don't know to try to have the energy as um, uh, up as possible in order to maybe try to to engage with uh, with the audience so yeah it's hard it's you know hard. what i find that um no one ever talks about the benefits of schizophrenia and having voices in your head because <laughs> you can give yourself feedback, you know, have arguments with somebody in the fake audience as you're presenting. It could be a real plus for uh, online content. Yeah, uh, sometimes when I'm doing a joke and yeah, because it's my natural way of, of uh, presenting or talking. It's like, okay, I said the joke and I know it's funny, but is it funny for you guys also? And yeah, you can hear any feedback and you're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Moving. <laughs> but, but my favorite thing, my personality is I, I do the, uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I try to deliver very dry. And so people are just like, is he serious? Did he, <laughs> uh, you know, you not know, like one of my favorites, I, I was an audience in New Zealand and I did, uh, I butchered uh, the, the uh, measurement, the, the, uh, the, the conversion to metric on purpose. I just, just ridiculous numbers. And just kept on talking, and everybody laughed. And I turned, I'm like, "What? That's accurate, is it?" You know, just kind of, kind of thing. I love that kind of, uh, you know, that it, it, same thing. It's, it's a great way one to check a pulse of an audience. You know, if they're reacting, if they're not asking questions, and they're, this is my interpretation. If they're not asking questions yet, they then laugh at a, at a, 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 a bit there in my presentation. Um, I know that it's like, well, I'm more confident that what I'm delivering is at least they're listening um, yeah. and that I may be answering the, the, the questions there. But I, but I do find my style is that I will constantly ask for questions. I'm not a wait until the end 
to ask your questions. I'm very much like an interrupt me with the question right there when it's relevant, when it's contextual. I know what's what's your preference. I also like to to discuss, um, and the, and here also depends on. Uh, um, I saw that it depends on the conference type, and, and right now I'm talking uh, for the in person uh, presentation because uh, when you have a limited time and someone is just after you, you have to be very careful with your time, and uh, sometimes there are. Uh, people in the audience that uh, just um, try to discuss their specific uh, um, right. topic. Yeah. So you're like, okay, but let's just discuss after that and see exactly if we can touch uh, into details. Uh, and what I've seen uh, when it comes to online presentations is the fact that with unmuting and muting yourself again, and you can't really have that uh, ask along the way uh, a question so you have to leave it for for the end so yeah indeed it's it's very weird to talk like for 45 minutes or yeah. half an hour and well, not well, having any feedback and then in the end just wait for the for the questions well one of the things i think we, we've learned kind of on that and i, and I wish that uh, you know more uh, when you're running a session yourself and it's all you it's hard to monitor discussion what's going on while you're trying to present and deliver, especially within a time frame. Um, having a moderator, and we've, we've done this for years, of course, with, with webinars, formal webinars, but when we've done hybrid events or just purely online events, when you have the presenter can be left to focus on that content, but you have somebody who's specifically looking for questions and then will raise their hand and cue that up and ask like, Hey, Christian, to stop you, there was a question about your comment on here about this, and they can kind of cue them up. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to have that as a resource. So I would almost argue that for, you know, closest that you can get to in person for online is having the presenter and having someone there moderating. They don't need to get in there. They don't need to facilitate and speak on there other than you know, asking questions and, and being there for the online community. That that's kind of my takeaway from, you know, doing this, uh, like we all been doing it online, but actually doing helping run the hybrid portion of two in person events in the last year and a half. Uh, we we got wonderful reviews on, you know, the, the fact that the moderators that that process helps so people felt more connected and felt heard, because they were able to pause the session and ask the questions that they weren't able to ask. Yeah, uh, but in here, it's also a thing that I've noticed is that in online, uh, people don't ask so many questions. And uh, like uh, at some point, I, I just asked for feedback from other um, MVPs and I was curious about, okay, maybe it's something wrong with me and I have to change something in my presentation. But no, I saw that it's maybe it's also because of the lack of interaction. You don't have the same interaction. It feels like, or maybe the, the audience has the uh, sensation that it's just uh, looking at a video okay. or it's just a, you know, a tutorial that you, that you watch. So maybe it's uh, the brain actually that is making some. Uh... So what do you do to, to solve that? Kind of what are your tactics? Well, first of all, as you were saying, I let the discussion open during the entire presentation, uh, but also in the end, I'm just uh, asking like more specific questions from the presentation, as in how you've solved this thing, like, okay, let's uh, discuss a bit and do some knowledge sharing about I'm having this and I solved it like this, but I'm not really sure of the solution. How is there anyone that actually work with this? You know, I'm trying to just put some uh, specific questions and asking uh, for some help just to uh, open the conversation and uh, see exactly if uh, really there are no questions or is just that sensation that, okay, let's just finish this because, oh my God, I'm tired of looking at my, uh, <laughs> at my laptop. So one of, the, one of the things I love doing is going through on a topic that I've done, especially if it's a session I've done several times is I'll have a list of the common questions that I, that I receive or that I, you know, that I have received for that, or that I see on the topic. It's a great way to kind of summarize, hopefully, you know, you've covered the con that content and answered that, but, you know, answer those questions. Um, but that could be a way to kind of free people up um, 
so that you're you don't have dead space of, of sitting there waiting for someone to ask a question then it's always awkward if, if they wait too long then they're more, less likely to ask the question because of that big pause there but if you ask for questions and then immediately you say hey real quick i mean this is a common question that i received on this topic and then answer that and then go back again hey are there any questions um then have another if still nothing say another question i hear all the time is is this that technique usually gets people thinking it frees up you know hey well i had this experience and what do you do about this and uh and it can turn into more of a conversation but that's that's kind of my way of doing that man it's painful when actually it's a good it's a good approach a thing that i was doing is uh trying always to uh do a better presentation the next time that I'm going to uh, present the same content is by answering of the common questions into the presentation while presenting. But this is a, also a very good approach on uh, just uh, having more engagement uh, at the Q&A session. So I do the same thing. I mean, that, that's that's how I update that content. In fact, I, I'll, I even say that, you know, while sometimes the title of the session that I do at two different online events might be the same, but rarely is the content exactly the same. I will, I'm constantly updating my, my kind of my active decks, my, those, the sessions, the topics that I'm speaking on. And so every time I give it, I've made modifications. I'd like that part didn't really work. Nobody had those questions or I know it's shocking. Microsoft changes stuff all the time. And so <laughs> making sure that it's up to date, uh, you know, is important as well. So, yeah. Well, let me let me ask you just in the last couple of minutes here. Um, so, so you, a developer technologies MVP, kind of what is the scope? What's your passion? What do you focus on within that space? Well, as I was saying, I'm talking a lot about my experiences. So I'm interested in architecture, and also uh, I talked a lot about uh, uh, APIs and uh, this uh, uh, collaboration between uh, the client side and the server side, and uh, also about uh, how many technologies we have at hand right now and how to choose them. So all the things that I encountered along the way, uh, <laughs> I'm talking about. Um, right now, uh, or what I've uh, worked the most uh, lately, it's with front-end technologies more, uh, basically on the Angular part and uh, yeah, also uh, some DevOps and uh, uh, in the area of uh, technical leadership. So I'm trying to combine it and then I just find something that, okay, this might be interesting to, to share. So this is the area. I'm still trying to, to find, let's say, uh, my way. Yeah, and I'm experimenting a lot with uh, with different areas just to to grow also and uh, yeah be a better um, maybe content deliver yeah to uh, deliver better content for uh, for the people in front of me. Well, that's that's a uh, I mean that's a great uh, goal to to have out there to constantly be you know developing that building that content and and again I, I learn better when I'm writing building content interviewing people, you know, about, about different things than if I just had my day job, just did it. There will always be just my personality type. There'll always be a community aspect of what I do is because I learn through doing and through the interaction by collaborating with people. The, the name of my series is collab talk. It's about, you know, kind of twofold, like the focus of my, most of my career has been in collaboration technology but it's also about you know collaboration and talk and chat. Collab talk sounded better than collab chat. That was actually <laughs> what I, I, I thought of calling it. But uh, you know, so it's it's about um, you know we can do more and learn so much more as you know from a community perspective than we can do on our own. Which doesn't say sometimes you don't carve off and go do your own thing and focus and read and learn and do some things. Um, but you need to come back and validate those things. And that's uh, just a tremendous power of community in helping us all collectively learn and improve and help each other. Uh, there is a saying that, you know, you've understood a certain topic. If you can explain it to a four year, a four year old uh, kid. And uh, I'm always thinking about the fact that uh, uh, going 
to this path and the preparing content actually helped me help me <laughs> grow a lot and uh, gain a lot of knowledge because I'm always thinking about okay do I understand this concept uh, really uh, if I'm having this issue is because um, I'm not like fully aware of the context or is just actually a problem so um, a lot of people think that when you are in front of an audience or when you're preparing some, any sort of content is because you know it everything or because you had all the experiences and uh, I think that we just don't realize how uh, this can be a, a motivation and a way of learning for uh, the one that uh, it's also presenting not yep. only for the ones that are in front of uh, and yeah. just listening. Well, uh, you know, and on that last one, last question here, have you ever had a heckler in a, in a presentation, like a, a true heckler, somebody who's just trying to trip you up, or maybe they know a lot about the topic and they're trying to poke holes in your presentation. Have you ever experienced that? Mm, I had at some point, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Hmm. Uh, uh, I had along the way, yeah, people that knew maybe more than me and uh, they were more experienced, but uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, that respect from them and to understand that, yeah, maybe my audience was uh, um, at another level or maybe some parts of the presentation were uh, for another level. But uh, I, what I really liked is the fact that after that, they still came to me and yeah there were people that i respected in the in the industry and they came to me and uh, yeah gave me feedback and uh, told me what they like about the the presentation during the presentation no not so not so much i haven't had bad experiences thank I, god <laughs> i've heard of other people having that it's like i've never had that kind of experience either i mean i i had in one presentation early on um where uh, 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 a young guy was just uh, making suggestions for improving the session. It was a brand new session. And people afterwards came up and was like, I can't believe that he called you out. And they did that stuff. I'm like, he was right. I, it was awesome feedback. And I, I'm really good friends with him now. And he became an MVP a few years later. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I hear about these other interactions and I've seen it a couple of times where it's more, you know, it's, it's more negative, but for, for the most part, I mean, people recognize that kind of the trolling of speakers, they recognize that for what it is. And you have to be uh, a little thick skinned, but having said that, you're right. When people have respect for that and they see that you are you know, responding to that and acknowledging, you know, that's a perspective I've not covered or, you know, that I, I did, wasn't aware of that, that's that new change. I'm going to go and research that needs to be included within a presentation. Thank you very much. Let's talk afterwards. You know, point me in the right direction so I can improve the content. And people respond to that. Yeah, and also uh, I noticed that uh, when there are situations like this, uh, the audience is very like helping the speaker. Uh, uh, they are trying just to give maybe answers or just they are trying to like make that person, uh, you know, fade away right. and let the speaker uh, continue. So it, that's nice because the audience really tries to, like the group really tries to help uh, the person that is, uh, that is speaking. And yep. that's nice. It's again, uh, for the ones that have, uh, I don't know, a fear of public speaking, maybe this is a point to take into consideration that the, the audience is always trying to, to help the speaker. There are ex exceptions, of course, but uh, right. generally, it works like this. Well, there's a whole other discussion getting into like the fear of presenting. That's another topic for another day. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mahal, I really appreciate you doing this, this interview and talking about your experience, your path in the MVP program. For folks that want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. What are the best ways to reach you? They can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where I'm uh, mostly, uh, mostly active. And in there you can find the, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, other ways to, to discuss with me through Twitter and, uh, <laughs> Uh, also my email. So yeah. Excellent. Well, hey, thanks so much. <laughs> Have a great weekend. I know it's the end of your day. I'm just kind of at the beginning of mine here with the nine hour difference here, but uh, thanks so much for your time and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me and have a great weekend. <laughs> <laughs>